All right, let's go ahead and read in chapter five. We're going to start in verse one here uh, in the book of Galatians. Uh, It says, stand fast, verse one, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. And do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Indeed, I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. And I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. You have become estranged from Christ, you who attempt to be justified by law. You have fallen from grace, for we... Through the Spirit, eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but faith working through love. And we'll go ahead and stop there for a moment. Uh, If you've been with us for the last few chapters in the book of Galatians, you know that Paul has, uh, he's had just such a neat writing and conversation so far with those in Galatia. And if you remember all the way back to chapter one, he begins with just kind of uh, greeting those in Galatia, the Galatians there. Uh, He begins also with a little bit of his testimony, sharing about who he is, where he came from, uh, his uh, conversion to the Lord, what the Lord did in his life personally. He shares, again, that personal testimony uh, of his between him and the Lord. He greets the Galatians with a lot of different emotions, a lot of different feelings. Uh, At times, he shares how proud he is of the Galatians. At times, he shares even how disappointed he is, right, with the Galatians. And uh, you all know, uh, growing up, that disappointment that we see at times as kids is like, ah, it almost hurts more than the punishment a lot of times, right? When your father comes in and he's like, you're, you know, it's, it's just that I'm disappointed in what you did. It's like, oh man, you know, you know, hit you hard right there with that one. And this is what Paul comes to the Galatians with. You know, man, I had such high hopes. You guys were doing so good, so well. And yet uh, you've had a setback. And loving Paul and just the way that he goes about things, he always ends with encouragement. And he's always there uh, to restore uh, people in the Lord. So as we come to chapter 5, we come now to more so of encouragement. And he starts out the chapter here in verse one with the phrase, stand fast. He says, stand fast, therefore in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. And I wanna hit on that a little bit, that phrase, stand fast. He says, you know, plant your feet, hold your ground, be strong, be of good courage, stand fast. And that is an encouragement to Paul, to a people that that are being bombarded, that are just being hit from all sides right now. As they came to the Lord, as the Galatians uh, accepted the Lord, accepted the testimony from Paul, as they came to know Christ, they are now being hit by the religious leaders, by the Jewish leaders, by those that are coming down into the region and telling them, that they have to follow the law of Moses. And even as we read there in the last few verses, uh, uh, that uh, he even hits on circumcision as well, that they must be circumcised. But Paul uses that phrase, stand fast. You know, a lot of times as believers, or as uh, I would even say as Americans, we stand fast, right? There's things that we, that we stand our ground on. You know, there's certain beliefs that we have, that we just will not let anybody, you know, push through us or change our minds on, you know, with the elections coming up, you may uh, always vote your party line, you know, and I've, I don't care who it is, I just vote my party line just straight down the ballot, you know, we stand fast on certain views. Paul is encouraging the Galatians to stand fast in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. And I want you to take note of what he is calling the believer to stand fast in. Because yes, we can have a lot of beliefs. Yes, we can have a lot of convictions. Yes, we can have, uh, you know, a a lot of things that, that we're just passionate about. 
But Paul is calling the believer to have more passion for the freedom that they find or that we find in Christ than the things that we have in the world, right? He says in the liberty. Liberty is something that a lot of people stand fast in, right? It's something that a lot of people are very passionate about. Uh, Again, especially being Americans, you know, we take our liberty very seriously. We, uh, we take our Second Amendment, for some of us, very seriously for those in, the, in this country. And, uh, and a, a liberty is so important. Liberty is, is something that is, uh, that is uh, you know, so important in so many people's lives that wars have been fought over it, right? That arguments at dinner tables have been had over it, Right? But Paul here says to stand fast, not in the liberties that we have as Americans, not in the liberties that we have as people, but he says to stand fast in the liberty that we have in Christ as Christians, as believers. And he goes on to say that has made us free and do not be entangled against, uh, again, with the yoke of bondage. See, as a believer, There's a lot of things that are important to us. And as an American, there's a lot of things that are important to us. But nothing should be more important to us than the freedom that we have and that we find in Jesus Christ. And it's through that freedom that we find salvation. It's through that freedom that we uh, that we, we have been pulled out from the bondage of the world, that we are no longer entangled with the things of the world. And he gives the Galatians a warning there. He says, do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage, specifically speaking to them about religion, about the religious leaders that were coming down once again into Galatia and telling them, hey, that's all great. That's all awesome that, you, that you've found Jesus, that you've, you've come to Christ. But as you do so, can we encourage you to not leave behind the things that you were brought up in, the traditions that we've been brought up in since our youth. The Passover, circumcision, you know, uh, um, you know uh, the Sabbath, all of the, Judish, the, the Jewish laws that we've been taught. And Paul has a very strong encouragement to them to flee from that type of doctrine, to flee from that type of talk and that type of life. And he calls it even bondage. He calls it bondage. He goes on to say in verse two, indeed I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. And I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. So he now speaks on a specific topic, on a specific, you know, subject. And and I want us to really um, take this chapter as a whole in its context, because though Paul is speaking of on a specific subject, that's what they may have been dealing with at that time. But we can also generalize as well what Paul is encouraging those in Galatia here. So specifically circumcision, but generally the things of the law, the things of religion and everything that comes along with it. And he says, reading again there in verse two, he says, I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. So he says, so you found Christ and yet these men are now encouraging you again at that time to be circumcised. Uh, For me, it was, you know, four weeks ago as two guys came to my door and and knocked on the door and, you know, and holding their Bible and all that. And I looked through the people and I was like, oh man, I really don't want to answer this right now. You know, it was a Sunday, you know, I, I had done my service already, you know, I had spent, you know, six hours at church already. It's like, Lord, I'm off the clock, you know, type of thing, type of attitude, you know, that I had, which is the wrong attitude, but, but that's the attitude that I had. And I answer the door And, you know, what I, you know, right away, I tell these guys, you know, hey, guy, I appreciate it and everything. But, you know, I just, I just got back from church. I thought for sure that's going to get them out of here, right? I just got back from church and, you know, I was just there all day and everything. And, you know, thank you guys. But, 
And right away, the first thing out of uh, the guy, this, this guy's mouth was, oh, you go to church on Sunday. And I was like, oh, man. Yes, I go to church on Sunday. Well, do you know that Sunday is not the Sabbath? And you need to go to church on Saturday. And we got into this whole long two hours, basically, into this conversation with these guys, you know, as I'm trying many times to just, you know, close the door. But it was, you know, for me, it was the Sabbath. And for many of you, I'm sure, as you guys have had the same encounters and a lot of the same stories. For the Galatians, it was circumcision. Just a different matter, just a different subject, right? And what is Paul telling them? He's saying, Whatever it is, whatever thing it is that you are grabbing onto that you feel like will get you closer to God will really cause what God has for you to have no effect on you. It will really take all of the power away from God. And every time I would speak to these guys and I would say, hey, let me ask you this. How do you believe you are saved? One of the first things was, well, you have to keep the Sabbath. I was like, oh, man. Well, what if, you, what if you accidentally miss it, you know? Oh, no, 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 no. That would never happen. What, what if, you know, power goes out, the alarm doesn't go off? You know, I mean, I've had that happen plenty of times, you know? Oh, no, 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 no. I have, you know, just multiple safety nets set up, so I will not miss the Sabbath. I'm like, oh, man. So I asked him again, you know, a couple more times. And every single time I would ask, it was always go back to me, I, I have to, I need to. And I said, man, you guys are taking all of the power away from Christ and what he has done. And it's the same lie from the enemy, just a different century, right? Paul, he says, he used circumcision. Christ will profit you nothing. Verse three, he says, and I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. So now not only do you have to keep the Sabbath, but now you have to keep the feasts. Now you have to keep, you know, all the little bits and pieces and and corners of the law. And even as we read in, in Corinthians on Friday night with our youth, Paul even encouraged them to wear the headdress, the covering, that we as Americans would say, no, 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 that's not right. That's not, that's not biblical, you know, or that's, you know, that kind of freaks us out and scares us. But that was Paul's encouragement to them, that if this is what feels, but, but at the end of it, he said, but us as church and as believers, we really, you know, don't have a preference. He said, if that is what the culture is at the time, if you want to look into that, you can. I probably opened up a whole can of worms for you right now. You can ask me questions later, but there's many different parts of the law that Paul is saying here in Galatians that if you are going to try to keep any of it, you are now going to have to try to keep all of it. Why? Because you're trying to obtain righteousness all on your own, right? That's really ultimately what you're trying to do. I can be righteous. I can obtain salvation. I can do this and that. And he's saying, if you're going to start down that road, you better make sure that you finish it. Because if you mess up even once, you've broken one part of the law, you've broken all of it, right? He says in verse four, you have become estranged from Christ. You who attempt to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. For we through the spirit eagerly await for the hope Wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything, but faith working through love. So really interesting turn that Paul takes here. So he says, if you're circumcised, if you're trying to follow the law, Christ will profit you nothing. So what do we say? Then no circumcision, right? Then no no keeping the Sabbath. Then no, you know, and we try to go so far to the other side now because we want to run and flee from the dangers or from the pitfalls of following the law. But yet Paul hits an interesting topic or an interesting point here. He says, uh, he says there in verse six, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision 
But he also says, nor uncircumcision avails anything. So I could just see the, Corinth, uh, or the Galatians there saying, great, well then let's not get circumcised. You know, we don't have a problem with that. You know, and, and running from that, you know, and, and, and just saying that's fine with us. And Paul's saying, well, hold on. See, now just as you were putting yourself into the law and you were, you were getting into that, that, that danger, you know, of, of being back into bondage and it was becoming a religion, it was becoming, you know, just that, that, con- that uh, repetition for you. The same can be true in trying to now not follow the law. Because now not being circumcised doesn't really profit you anything either, does it? But really, what is it? It's that relationship with the Lord. It's the one-on-one relationship with Jesus that we need to be seeking after. It's not the works. It's not the what do I need to do. It's not even the what do I not need to do but it's the getting that one-on-one personal relationship with Jesus is what it is. It's the same lie from the enemy, you guys. It's so interesting because, uh, you know, this, this whole thought of righteousness, you know, this whole obtaining, as Paul is speaking to those that are desiring to be justified by the law, they're trying to constantly obtain righteousness all on their own. Really, what it is, is it's just that placebo effect, right? It's just that placebo. What is a placebo? You know, if you, if you look up the definition, all it is is something that psychologically, you know, makes you feel better or, or you know, psychologically fixes a problem or an issue. And this is just a placebo that, that you are taking with religion. You feel like, you think that, you are getting closer to God when in reality you are estranged from him. You are completely separated from God. You know, this, uh, this last week I was at home and, and I was watching Luke in the morning. I was working from home for a couple hours in the morning. And, and usually when I do, uh, you know, Luke is up in the morning for about an hour. He eats, well, a few hours, but he eats, watches some cartoons and then he uh, has a bottle right about 9, 30, 10 o'clock, and he's out for another two hours, right? Living the life, right? That's just the life right there, I'm jealous. And uh, so, you know, I always know, okay, give him a bottle right about 9, 30, 10 o'clock. Make sure he's tired. Make sure he's, you know, a little drowsy. He's already, you know, knees are already weak when he's walking and stuff. And, like, and, and you know, he's going he's gonna to knock out. And um, it's going to allow dad to, to take care of, you know, whatever he needs to and go work in the office for a couple hours. So I give him a bottle uh, that morning and I, I set him down in his crib and he has the bottle and, and he's sitting there sucking on it for a while. And I go into the office and I'm, I'm doing, you know, whatever I, I'm doing for work and stuff on the computer. And probably like 15 minutes go by and all of a sudden he starts crying, right? He just starts whimpering and and just real fussy, you know, and I can kind of hear him like rolling around and stuff. And I'm like, what's going on? Normally he's asleep already, right? Like 15 minutes in and he's out. So I kind of go in there and I walk down the hallway and peek my head, at, you know, around the corner and look in the room and, and uh, try to let him not see me. And, and he's there wide awake, right? His eyes are open and he still has the bottle in his mouth, right? And he's sucking on the bottle and everything. And, and I'm like, he's drinking his bottle. Okay, maybe he just got fussy or something. And, All right, just let him be. And I go back to work. And, uh, you know, another 10 minutes go by and, and he's fine. You know, he's fine for 10 minutes or so. And, and all of a sudden he starts crying again and he's, he starts kicking again and just tossing and turning. I'm like, what's going on with this kid? Why, why, what's bothering him? You know, so I go back in the room and I look and, and he, and he has like tears coming down his face, you know, and he's, and he's starting to like get a lot more fussy and everything. And, and I go in there and the bottle is still full there's a little white disc that is inside the nipple that keeps the milk from spilling out. So I gave him, the, as you already imagined, I gave him the bottle and I forgot to take that disc out. So for about a half hour, he was sucking on that bottle. And you know what the funny thing is, though? It did a good job still for a little bit of time until he realized he wasn't getting any milk. And then, you know, it hit him and he started to get fussy, right? So I went in there and pulled the cap off and, and uh, you know, gave him the bottle and, and he was great. He went straight to bed. But I just thought, wow, how, how funny that is though 
And how interesting that is that, that that really is how religion is. It's that placebo effect. We have that bottle and we're sucking on it and it works for a time and, it, and we think we're doing all right and we're like, yeah, I'm good. And then down the road, we realize, hey, this thing is dry. I'm not getting anything from this. And that's exactly what religion does. We try to work for it. And we can, you know, we can sit here in Calvary and go, oh, thank God we're not like that here. You know, thank God that we know the truth and our eyes have been opened and, you know, we, uh, we love grace and we fall on grace and, and everything. And, but, you know, the same is true for those that believe in grace and live by grace. The same can be true, the same pitfalls. And I think that's why Paul even hit there in verse six that even to the uncircumcised, even to those that are not focused on the law, even to those that flee the law, it p- can become repetition. It can still become religion. Moving on in verse seven, Paul says, you ran well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion does not come from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence, verse 10, in you, in the Lord, that, uh, that you will have no other mind, but he who troubles you shall bear his judgment, whoever he is. So Paul starts off in verse 7. He says, you ran well. Galatians, you guys were doing great. You guys were doing amazing, right? You did a really good job. Again, praising and just thanking the Galatians or the Lord for who the Galatians are and were. And he says, though, continuing on there in verse 7, he says, who hindered you from obeying the truth? He says, what happened? Who was it, guys, that came in and distorted the truth of God and the, 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 the path that you were on? You know, there's so many verses in the Bible about uh, the encouragement from other believers, right? You know, there's iron sharpens iron, you know, so one man sharpens another man's countenance, you know, and there, there's just so many verses, you know, that encourage us to get that godly biblical counsel or to have those Christian friends, you know, those believers that can encourage us and can sharpen us in the Lord. But how important it is to make sure that those people that we allow in our lives are doing just that, that they are sharpening us and not doing damage, not steering us astray, not, you know, uh, pulling us off track from where God had us. He tells them that you guys were doing great. You guys ran well. You know, you started off just, you know, just really good. You know, I just think of the Olympics that's going on right now. And you see all these runners that are, you know, going on that are, that these races that are happening. And, you know, how many of them, you know, I don't know if you you see the little clips of, I don't even know what country they were from, but the, you know, they get tangled up with each other and they fall and trip and everything and they're on the floor and, and, uh, you know, they show the clip of the one girl helping the other one up, you know, and they both make it though past the finish line. You know, it just kind of reminds me of that type of picture. You know, we're running that race and we start off, well, you might be in first place, you know, or in top three, you're going to get a medal. But what happens? You end up getting tangled up with somebody you end up getting tangled up with someone that you shouldn't have. Maybe even thinking, well, Lord, if I could just, if I could just show them, if I could just encourage them, if I could just give them a good word or, you know, I'm going to pray for them and, you know, yeah, we'll go out a couple times and, and I'm going to go out with them because then maybe they'll just one day go to church with me, you know? And then before you know it, it's, you know, the, the influence is coming more from their side to you than from you to them. And this is an encouragement from Paul to be careful of who we surround ourselves with, to be careful of who our friends are, because uh, a lot of times we will become who our friends are, right? A lot of times we'll become like those that we are hanging out with. He says, you ran well, who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion does not come from him who calls you. So this wasn't from God. This wasn't from the Lord. And I could just see them scratching their heads and going, Paul, what are you talking about? We've been following God this whole time. You know, we're, we're all circumcised now. 
You know, we're all following the Sabbath. We're all, you know, and they're sitting there like, Paul, what are you? You know, I can just think of the believer that's in that same situation. What are you talking about? I still go to church. I still, I still like, you know, the scripture posts on Facebook, you know? I still, you know, I, I still go to the Harvest Crusade once a year. But yet their hearts are far from God in reality. Verse nine says, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. And interesting because a lot of times you, you, you hear that phrase or that scripture and you always think of, of what? What do you think of when you hear leaven? Sin, right? You always think of sin. But in the context here, really Paul's talking about legalism. He's talking about the law. He's talking about religion. And he's like, hey guys, you guys were you guys were doing well. And and yes, that is all sin and all that, because it's apart from God and everything, and, and that is there. But he's he's also talking about the law. And he's talking about, hey, you get a little bit of the law, you get a little bit of legalism. You know, a lot of times when we witness to somebody, what what's the 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 thing that what's the way we want to witness to them? You know, hey, you should go to church. You know? Hey, what are you doing on Sunday? Is, is, is that really going to, you know, is that really witnessing to them? You know, and, and I'm, I do that too, but really what they need is the gospel. Really what they need is Jesus. Really what they need is that relationship with the Lord. He says a little bit of leaven leavens the whole lump. Verse 10, I have confidence in you, in the Lord, that you will have no other mind but he who troubles you shall bear his judgment, whoever he is. And I, brethren, if I still preach circumcision, why do I still suffer persecution? Then the offense of the cross has ceased. I could wish that those who trouble you would even cut themselves off. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty. Excuse me as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word. Even in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed by one another. So Paul here again, encouraging the Galatians in the liberty that we find in Christ and encouraging them in this liberty to not take advantage of this liberty, to not use the liberty as an opportunity, as he says there in verse 13, he says, for you brethren have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh but through love serve one another. And a lot of times that is the danger and that's the fear. And to be honest with you, a lot of times that is what drives many to legalism. That is what drives many to a lot of the denominations like Seventh-day Adventists, you know, or, or like, uh, you know, or like, uh, you know, um, what's another one? There's one on the tip of my tongue. There's a few of them. We don't have to name them all. <laughs> but that's one of the dangers. That's one, I would say that's one of the fears about Calvary. Can we say that? That's, a, that's what a lot of people fear about Calvary. Oh, they, you know, they, they, they dwell too much on grace. They, they, they take too, too much, uh, they have too, much, too many liberties. You know, they, they uh, live by, the, by grace a little, a little too much there. And, and that fear drives people almost to legalism. It drives people to want to follow the law. Why? Because they're so afraid that, uh, that they will or that people will end up taking advantage of grace and that they'll end up taking advantage of those liberties. And really, I don't think fear should ever keep you from doing what is right. Fear should never keep you from following the Lord. Fear should never keep you from following his word and, and, and from believing and following his doctrine. But really, that is the fear. Because why? Uh, you know, you've, you've read the book, you know, if you give a mouse a cookie, right? 
That's, that's, that right there can sum up, you know, all of Paul's, you know, uh, beliefs right here to the Galatians. You know, you give a mouse a cookie, and they're going to, what, ask for a glass of milk, right? There, there's a little bit more in between there or something? Yeah. You know, you give a, you give a Christian, you know, a, you know, a day off, you know, and, and I, they're going to ask for, you know, something, I, I don't know. It's like, you know, it's that whole, it's that whole dilemma that we have there. It's that, it's, it's such a fear that we are going to take advantage of it. But really, uh, as long as we keep the Lord first, as long as we keep him front and center, there really is no fear of taking advantage of that liberty. Why? Because you will naturally, you will naturally begin to follow Christ. You will naturally desire to just obey him, you know, and oh, I have all the freedom and yeah, you can, you know, go to the, you know, on a, for somebody's birthday party, you can go to a bar, you know, and, and go celebrate and all that, you know, and I'm a believer and I have freedom in the Lord. Yeah, absolutely. You're, st- you're still a believer. You're still going to, to heaven, you know, but because you are Christ and because you are a true follower of Jesus, you will not go to that bar and sin and, and, and be involved in sin and, and commit that sin and, and be, you know, tempted by that sin and all that. You know, but, that, but that, uh, that legalism says, no, I can't even go, you know, whatsoever. And I need to stay here in my bubble, you know, because of that fear of even, you know, breaking or, you know, not following the Lord 100%. But he says that what he says, verse 14, for all the laws fulfilled in one word, even in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, beware, lest you be consumed by one another. And really it, it comes down to that, that love will fulfill the law, right? Why? Because then we won't be, you know, uh, we won't be lying. We won't be stealing. We won't be, you know, committing murder, you know, if you love somebody. You won't, you won't be breaking all of the law of God or all of God's desires or commandments. You will be fulfilling all of the law through loving your neighbor and through loving others. And he says in verse 15, but if you backbite, if you, you know, if you sit there and want to devour one another, that's exactly what you're going to get in return. So your mindset is, is to correct everyone. Well, I've been called to correct. I've been called to fix, you know, the problems here. You know, I've been called, and all of a sudden, it, it becomes, you know, this thing that you are the one with all of the answers, and everybody else just doesn't know what they're talking about, and there's this spirit of condemnation that you have. And Paul says, hey, if that's gonna be your mindset, then be ready to have that mindset also come against you. Be ready to have condemnation also thrown on you. Be ready to have judgment be thrown your way. He doesn't say take advantage of or, or you know, live in the, you know, in, <laughs> in correcting others and live in the truth, you know, of, of the, the Bible or doc, God's doctrines. No, he says uh, that you're called to the liberties. You're called to the freedoms of it. And he says that it's all fulfilled in just love. Love. What a simple concept that he's called us to. Verse 16 says, I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. So how do I know if I'm being led by the Spirit? How do I know if I'm in the grace of God? You know, since I've started uh, teaching the book of Galatians, I've had a few people come to me even and go, hey, you know, what is grace? I still don't even really get, like, what is this thing about grace? You know, why is it even such a big deal? And, you know, what does it even mean, really? You know, and some people have, have come up and said, hey, you know, I, it just makes me want to even learn more about grace and get into it a little bit more and how it really does pertain to me and to, and to my walk with the Lord. But how do we know that we're in grace? How do we know that we're walking in the spirit? And really, that's, this is what Paul hits now for the rest of the chapter. He says, he says, walk in the spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So these two things are contrary to one another. You're either in the spirit or you're in the flesh. 
one or the other. You can't be in both, right? You're either walking according to the Lord, you're either walking according to his grace, or you're walking according to your own flesh. You're walking according to everything that is in opposition to Christ, to God. He says that if you walk in the spirit, you won't fulfill the things or the lust of the flesh. So if we're walking in grace, then again, naturally, we'll begin to cast off the things of the world. Naturally, naturally, our spirits will be conformed and molded and shaped into his image. Naturally, we'll give up the attitude you know, of the world and these, these old things that are, that are old that our old bodies, you know, just t- continually struggle with. He says in verse 18, but if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. So again, it takes us out of the law, yet at the very same time, it fulfills the law. Very interesting. We're not under the law, but yet we'll be fulfilling the law. Really neat how the Lord does that. Verse 19, now the works of the flesh are evident. So anytime we have a situation in our life that we need to ask ourselves, am I in the spirit? Am I in grace? Or am I acting out of my flesh? Go to Galatians 5 and read verses uh, 19 through 26. And this will tell you, this will let you know. Am I in grace? Am I in the spirit? Well, let's read verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are evident. They're evident. They might not be evident to you. They're evident to everyone around you. Everybody else knows, right? And and I think if we're honest with ourselves, they're evident to us as well. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness. So if we're dealing with any type of sexual immorality, Paul says right away, it's evident you are in the flesh. And, you know, it's interesting because whenever it's something that we're not struggling with, you know, we we kind of just, we tend to sweep it under the rug, right? We tend to be real passive with it. Well, duh, right? Like, it's like, of course, you know, do we really need to point that out, Paul? But I don't have to tell you that there's plenty of believers that live with their partner, you know, or their significant other before marriage, right? Living in sexual sin and still believing that they are in the will of God. Paul would say, no, you're in the works of the flesh. You're in the flesh right now. He goes on to say in verse 20, idolatry, sorcery, So anything that is, uh, you know, spiritualism or mysticism that is outside of the realms of Christianity, that is outside of our biblical doctrines. You know, I I cringe every time somebody asks me, what's my sign, right? You ever get people to do that? Yeah, that's that's what I want to say, right? You know, oh, are you a Leo? Are you a Cancer? Are you a, no, I'm a Christian. You know, it's like, I don't, I don't even know what I am, tell you the truth. You know, like, I don't, I don't. You know, don't get into those things. And I hate it. Anytime, you know, you like just meet someone on the street and they just, oh, what's your, oh, you must be a, you know, when's your birthday? And they ask you right away. Oh, okay. That explains a lot. And it's like, what, what is that? Are you, are you, is that like a diss or something or what? You know? And it's like, Paul says, man, anything that is idolatry, anything that is praise, anything that is glorification to anyone or anything else other than Christ, other than God, guess what? You're in the flesh. Don't look to the stars. Don't look to, you know, the birthstones and and all these things. You're in the flesh. He goes on to say in verse 20, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath. Anyone deal with that? Don't raise your hand. Selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies. You know, uh, I think that's a a very predominant one in a lot of people's lives is wrath, a lot of anger. There's many families that are torn apart with spouses that have anger issues, that have problems controlling their temper, right? 
And we all deal with it because we live in Southern California and we drive on the freeways. And you've been on the 91 lately, you know, where it's all comes down to one lane. And you just want to roll down the window and throw your coffee at, you know, one of the guys working on the, the road. Or maybe you don't want to do that. It's good. But we all deal with those outbursts of wrath, you know. We, we struggle with those things. Paul says, guess what? You're in the flesh. You're not walking according to grace. What is grace? Grace is the opposite of all these things. Grace is, you know, being stuck on the freeway and then enjoying it, you know. Yeah, it's like, how do we, huh? You know, I've, I've shared this before, but, you know, Rosalind, ugh, she'd always do that to me. I would literally get stuck on the, fr- I would miss the off ramp. And, and I've shared this before with you guys, but she would go, you know, hey, look at the bright side. We get to spend more time together in the car. And I go, ha, yes, we do. <laughs> You're right, you know, it's so awesome. You know, and it's just like always looking at the positive side, though rather than looking at the negative and having, you know, that dis- <laughs> those, uh, you know, those outbursts there, the dissensions, always wanting to divide rather than bring people together. You know, some people like that. Some people that are always just instigators, right? Always just wanting to instigate a situation and just cause problems and issues and, and you know, turn people against each other those dissensions. Verse 21, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like. The ESV version says rivalries. Always always coming up with a rival, right? Always having an enemy. There's always an enemy in life. There's always somebody or something, you know, to blame it on. It's, you know, we want to blame the current government always you know we want to blame the you know whatever there's always an enemy there's always a rival there's always something you know to fight and to war against there's always competition right and competition can be good there's friendly competition you know we we had some guys and and girls over at the house yesterday and we had some friendly competition right and it was fun and everyone laughed and we were all still friends at the end of the night and that's always a positive sign we didn't play Monopoly, so that's usually when everyone stays friends, when you don't bring that game out, you know. But there's also, you know, competition that is not healthy. There's also that, that competitive attitude that will do anything, right, that will go any distance, whether it be cheating, whether it be lying, you know, whatever it be. I am going to put all of my morals aside to win, you know, to beat this person or this thing. Paul says, you're in the flesh. He goes on to say in verse 21, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Why? Why? Because you're not living in the grace of God. Can you live in all of these things? Can you practice these things habitually, continually? Can you live in these things all every day and really say that you are living in the grace of God? That you're walking in the Spirit? And then I love the contrast that he has here in verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is this. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, Goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such, there is no law. Isn't that awesome? How do we follow the law? How do we follow God's commandments? How do we, you know, stay within God's will? It's not by coming to church on Sunday. It's not by following the Sabbath or the feasts or the Jewish laws and traditions. It's not by these religious acts but it's through love and joy and peace and long suffering and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. Paul says against such, there is no law. There's nothing to condemn you. There's nothing to judge you at that point. He says in verse 24, and those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its 
passions and desires. They've taken steps. Yes, maybe they're, they've struggled, you know, they're struggling with things. Yes, you, you know, we're not necessarily going to have all of these things beat and conquered in our lives. There will always be struggles, but they've taken steps. They've made, the, you know, the commitment. They've made the, you know, the, uh, you know they, they've taken the task at living these things out. Verse 24, and those who are Christ have crucified the flesh and its passions and desires. Verse 25, if we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. And Paul ends it like this. He says, hey, if you are truly Christ, if you're truly walking in the spirit, if you are truly a believer and, and, a, and a, a one that is led by grace and believes in grace, then he says, let us also walk in these things. He says, let us also live these things out. You know, many times people do not live out their, what, their beliefs, right? What they believe. You see it a lot of times, even in politicians, right? You see uh, uh, somebody who will campaign against a certain thing, you know, they, they, they're all about this proposition, you know, and they're, and they're the ones shouting the loudest. And then all of a sudden it comes out a year later that they were the very one that was breaking that law, you know, or the one that was living that type of lifestyle that that proposition is in complete opposition to. And you're just like, what? Not living out our beliefs. And sometimes we do that as believers. We go, yeah, we believe in love. Yeah, we believe in grace. Yeah, we believe in patience and faithfulness and long suffering and all these things. And all of a sudden, the first opportunity we get to yell at somebody because it feels good, right? It's like, oh man, well, they were late, you know, and they didn't show up for my cable on time. You know, and it's, we just want to, oh, I'm going to let them have it right now. Paul says, no, live these things out. He says in verse 26, do not become conceited provoking one another and envying one another. Don't let it go, get to your head either. Keep the right attitude. 